Hi, my name is Linda Crago. Uh, I own and operate Tree and Twig Farm in Wellenport, which is in the Niagara region. And today we're going to talk about uh, heirlooms and seed saving. This is a, just a little shot of my farm so you get an idea of where I'm talking to you from. So what do these terms mean? Hybrid open pollinated heirloom and sometimes organic gets thrown into the mix. Well, a hybrid is a plant uh, that is produced by crossing two open pollinated varieties and uh, ending up with something that you desire. Maybe it's something that ships well, stores well, tastes fantastic, um, any of those. It is different than an uh, open pollinated or heirloom variety because safe seed will not grow true to type. Unlike this, Aunt Ruby's German Green, which is a very storied old heirloom variety, open pollinated, so the save seed does grow true to type. So what are heirlooms? So heirlooms are plants usually considered uh, at least 50 years old, so older varieties, and perhaps they've been passed down from generation to generation in a family, like that Aunt Ruby's uh, German green tomato I just showed you. Uh, there actually was an Aunt Ruby in Tennessee, and uh, one of the things that the, is the most important about heirlooms is that they are open pollinated, meaning that uh, saved seed will grow true to type. Heirlooms are always open pollinated, but open pollinated plants are not always heirlooms. This is an heirloom from Italy. It's uh, Mount Vesuvius. So it, it is grown in and around Mount Vesuvius. Um, it's a tomato that stays uh, on the vine for a long time, and when the the non-tomato season comes, uh, the plant can be pulled up uh, with the tomatoes on it and stored, uh, hanging upside down, and the tomatoes will ripen very slowly. Really quite a fantastic variety. Uh, I had a great opportunity to go to Oaxaca, Mexico, actually only a year and a half ago or so, and we could still travel, um, and I went to the Ethnobotanical Gardens there and saw some really great old heirloom varieties growing. The, the little plant that looks kind of grass-like is uh, Teosinte, which is the forerunner of our modern-day corn, of all our corn, actually, quite interesting. It was really neat to see it grow. I had heard a lot about it. And this is what the actual uh, seed pod looks like. So that's what came before corn. I, I think that's really interesting. So why do we want to grow heirlooms? Well, I think, I think uh, the variety is one of the best reasons, but pro and taste. Um, Heirlooms are grown uh, because they are they have things that make them worthwhile. Taste, appearance, uh, they grow well in our area. Whereas oftentimes hybrids are used, uh, are grown because they ship well, store well, and are, are uh, uniform at market. Grow heirlooms, try something different. This is kind of interesting to think about what's happened with our vegetable varieties over the last whole bunch of years. So. A stunning sort of thought is that over the last hundred years, 90% of our vegetable varieties have completely disappeared. This, this chart is interesting. So comparing what was available in a 1903 seed catalog to what was available 80 years later in 1983. So let's look at the radish, for example. In 1903, there were 463 varieties. But as we follow that down the chart, we see that in 1983, only 27 remained. That shows you very starkly what's happening with our vegetable varieties. People are concerned about this. So in Norway, there is a seed saving vault where um, all, the, all the countries in the world have varieties of uh, produce, of vegetables, fruits uh, um, saved there because people are concerned that there is a chance this diversity could be lost. This is a very important thing because diversity really is uh, security, food security for us. If you want to think about what happened during the Irish potato famine, more than a million people died because they relied on potato um, that was uniformly grown across Ireland. Another 200 or 2 million people actually left Ireland in search for something better. If you're interested in heirlooms, and who wouldn't be now, um, it's interesting to look up uh, Seeds of Diversity, which is Canada's heritage seed program or Seed Savers Exchange, the American version, the largest uh, nonprofit organization in the world devoted to keeping these varieties going. 
um, you get a yearbook once a year and you can actually directly uh, ask people who are growing these varieties to send you seed for minimal cost, the cost of a stamp. Heirlooms can change your life. <laughs> if only I'd shown them my heirlooms. Why do we want to plant from seed? Um, well, variety. With more than 10,000 varieties of tomatoes, 40,000 varieties of beans, thousands of varieties of every other thing you can imagine, peppers, peas, flowers, herbs. These are things you wouldn't ever find in a garden center. Obviously the cost is a lot less for, you know, the average cost of, you know, $3 or $3.50 for a pack of seeds. You're really getting a great value for your money. And because it's wonderful to take a, 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 a seed, plant it, and complete the circle, have the produce, save the seed, it, it's really a wonderful feeling. Look at the varieties of tomatoes. It's remarkable, really. That's why I keep growing them. The blue, new blues are, are quite interesting. Um, and all open pollinated. A lot of them are open pollinated. Peppers, look at those colors. And heat levels. Carrots are always best grown from seed because uh, they have that long tap root that doesn't transplant well. Same with beets, parsnips, all the root vegetables. You'd never find this in a garden center. This is a jelly melon, quite different again. And look at that beautiful flesh, very tropical tasting with a cucumber end, if you can imagine that. Look at how happy I am in my greenhouse with all the seeds I've planted and the, and the beautiful tomatoes. Why do we want to save seed? Because sometimes you'll never find the variety of seed again. You, it's a, uh, Sometimes impossible if a seed company drops a variety to find it again. You can also produce seed that's better acclimatized to your, your conditions, your soil, your weather. So seed you save yourself will usually do better in your garden than seed you purchase. You can also have interesting things happen. Off chance, you can have varieties that decide to, to uh, cross-pollinate in your garden and you get interesting varieties. You've become a plant breeder which if you save your seed, you always are because you're, you're reselecting. You can also get seeds with characteristics you desire. So if I see a tomato that's producing a fruit really early, if I save seed from that, I may get that characteristic, you know, carrying over. This is an example of a tomato that I saved seed from, fortunately, about 20 years ago and continue to save seed from, Rockwood Golden Tiger. The company that I had uh, gotten the original seed from went out of business, and that was the end of that variety, and it wasn't commercially available anywhere else. I'm certainly glad I've saved it. This is a, an interesting bean that cross-pollinated in my garden, um, and I've called it Wayne Fleet Wonder to this point. I'll continue saving it and growing it out, but it's a wonderful pale yellow bean, very slim, with purple striping. And this is a tomato that I try to get uh, a jump on every spring. I save seed from my earliest fruit and I've got it down to about 55 days now. And who the heck has ever seen this in a seed catalog or a, as a transplant? This is an oddity that showed up in my garden, a uh, variegated lacinated kale. How great to save seed from that. Whoops. So, Here's some things to think about when you're saving seed. We've talked a little bit about this. Is the variety hybrid or, or is it open pollinated? Hybrid variety um, will not come true to type from the saved seed, but it's not to say you can't save it. If it's open pollinated and you're being careful about how you're saving the seed, it will come true to type. So you want to keep your variety of seed pure, as pure as you can. So if you have a small garden space, limit the number of varieties that you're planting. So maybe plant, um, you know, one variety of bean. Say plant kale, but not cabbage, kohlrabi, broccoli, all those other things. Um, you can set up barriers. So an actual physical barrier made out of agricultural fabric, for example, so that uh, bees and other pollinating insects can't get in to carry the pollen elsewhere. You can consider uh, planting things at different times, staggering your planting dates so that pollination isn't happening at the same time on those plants. Or plant things at a distance from each other in the garden. Some distances aren't that extreme, say 20 feet for tomatoes 
or two miles of corn, which is very difficult. So let's look at some of the seed saving uh, barriers that uh, Seed Savers Exchange has set up. I had a chance to visit a few times uh, their wonderful farm in Iowa. So you can see in the distance their seed saving tents. As we get closer, you can see that they are made of uh, a, a agricultural fabric that uh, can't be penetrated by insects. So no pollen is going to be uh, passing through those tents, so the seed will be pure. Um, these larger tents have a good variety of different vegetables in them, um, so that uh, because they're different, there is no cross-pollinating in there, and they've actually put beehives inside those, so the, the, the plants will be pollinated. So you want to know your plants, your environment, and your pollinators if you're saving seed. So we'll talk a little bit about plants. The environment you're, you're thinking about is, are your neighbors growing some of the same things you are? Are your, are your crops going to cross-pollinate with them? Are you living in a windy environment? Are, do you have lots of bees, lots of pollinators around? It's great to be observant in the garden. You can really learn so much about your plants and uh, your seed saving. So let's know our plants. Um, we've, talked, we've shown you this before. So this is a guano melon, but the melon name is misleading. It's actually a cucumber, so this plant will cross with other cucumbers. So look at the Latin name on your plants and understand what it is you're dealing with when you're saving seed. This is a striped Armenian cucumber, but it's not a cucumber, it's in the melon family, so it will cross with other melons. It tastes very much like a cucumber, but that's not the family that it's in. Be aware that some species can contain many crop types. So for example, brassicas can be tricky to save seed from. Kale, kohlrabi, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, and cauliflower can all cross. These are all biennials, so you will get the seed in the second year, but be aware that they can cross very readily. Also, vegetables might have weedy relatives. You can probably think um, what uh, weedy relative would cross with your domesticated carrots in the garden. And that would be Queen Anne's lace, often found in, in ditches and uh, weedy fields. And know how your plants pollinate. Wind, bees, um, are they self-pollinating? Do they need another plant to pollinate? Are your plants annuals or biennials? So do they uh, produce their seed in the first year or do they produce their seed in the second year? So let's talk about selfers. So these are inbreeding plants like for example tomatoes. So tomato flower is a perfect flower. The male and the female parts are in the same flower. They're easily uh, pollinated. Um, if you're concerned about your tomato plant pollination simply shake the plant um, and then nature will do the rest. Very seldom to tomatoes cross-pollinate, but that's not to say they can't. This is a cool variety called Rhizotomat. It looks like cherry tomatoes. They're all fused together. I'm just going to show you some wonderful heirloom tomatoes. These are some of my favorites. This is a nice old variety. Beautifully ribbed. It could be a sculpture. It's Zapotec ribbed. Cherokee Rose. This is a newer open pollinated variety. Um, an offspring of Cherokee Purple. It's got a bit of a fuzzy skin. It's quite interesting. Look at the varieties, the bicolors, the stripes, um, the white tomatoes. It's really remarkable. Black, purple, blue. There's so many different varieties. Early, mid-season, late. The choice is really endless. Um, that little blue tomato in the left-hand corner is one that actually cross-pollinated in my garden, and I've managed to, to grow it out successfully so that the seed is always coming true to type. So I have my new open pollinated variety that I've named TT Baby Blue. It's really a great little currant tomato. And this is what happens when you save seed from hybrids. So you definitely don't get what the original plant was. The saved seed goes can revert back, you know, a generation, a couple generations into something different. And usually you consider it less desirable. Um, but I like these little tomatoes. This was from a hybrid that I got in a grocery store um, one winter, and I thought I'll save the seed and see what happens. So I've grown it out for probably about six years, and I like this sort of peanutty shape, so I've stuck with that. This is a great little tomato house that's, that's in front of my daughter and uh, Molly. 
and uh, this plant grows about 12 inches high, produces unbelievable amounts of little red tomatoes, so many that the plant will fall over, but the idea being that in the fall you can bring it in over winter and maybe you'll get a lovely taste of a tomato or two. This is a purple uh, paste tomato called Wessel's Purple Pride, another wonderful open pollinated variety. And look at that black. This is called Black Beauty. Wait till you see the inside. Juicy, sweet. What a wonderful tomato. Another beautiful open pollinated bicolor, Lithium Sunset. This is a newer variety again. Um, very sweet, very fruity. It's just wonderful. How do you save tomato seed? Well, um, you find a healthy plant. You find a tomato that's perfectly ripe, looks good, no cracking, no scarring. Or, and best represents that variety. The, the fruit is a little ripe, overripe possibly. Um, slice it open, squish the innards into a, a dish or a jar, add a little bit of water, and then let it sit for a couple days. There will be all kinds of flies and bees wanting to buzz around it, but you put up with that. <clears throat> when, when you get this mold over top, then just simply uh, rinse it all out in a sieve with cold running water until it's nice and clean, and then lay it out. I lay it out on newspapers in my house, in a place sort of far away so it's not in my way, and I let it sit until it's dry, usually up to a week or so. Label it, then I store it um, in, in jars is always good. Something that's going to keep it nice and dry, and I always sink them nice and deep into my chest freezer. So the seeds stay viable for a long time. That little bit of mold can possibly um, break down any bacteria that's on the seed, although we don't know that for sure, but it sure does break down that gel uh, surrounding the seed. This is a tomato relative, lychee tomato. Um, again, uh, you save the seed in a similar fashion, um, but with this kind of fruit, tomatillas, ground cherries, cape gooseberries, put the, put the right fruit into uh, a blender, fill, fill the blender with water, whir it around a few times and you'll see the nice fresh seed sink to the bottom, the skin and the pulp and the seed that's not viable will float to the top. Drain it out in a sieve, clean it with cold running water and then again lay it out to dry. Beans are another uh, self-pollinating plant. Seldom cross. More than 40,000 varieties of beans are available to you. So with beans, simply let the, the beans uh, go past the eating stage until they dry in the plant. The whole plant dries out. When you shake the plant and you hear the beans rattle in their pods, they're ready for saving. So that's it. You've got seed for the next year and you have uh, extra beans if you want to use them in soups or stews. Peppers are self-pollinating. Thousands of varieties of peppers. When the peppers uh, typically red, then it's ready for seed saving. Slice the peppers open, pull out the seeds, let them dry. But just because things can't cross pollen, don't generally cross pollinate, doesn't mean they can't. Sometimes you'll see the bees flitting between your pepper plants, your tomato plants, and then, then the magic happens in the garden. It's not always a bad thing. Eggplants are the same, self-pollinating. Um, and uh, with eggplants, it's kind of interesting. Um, that's a green pea eggplant from Thailand, very small. And you want the eggplants to actually turn yellow um, before you save the seed. Then you know they're ripe for, for seed saving. Lettuce is the same. So let it go past the eating stage. It's milky. It'll send up its seed stalk that will look a lot like this. And it will develop in, uh, little yellow flowers like dandelions. The white fluff, let the whole plant dry. Put a paper bag over the top of it. Cut the stem. Turn the seed stalk into the paper bag. And then you've got your seed for next year and many years beyond. The beauty of it is lots of the seed will drop to the ground and you'll have uh, early lettuce in the spring. If you are concerned about cross-pollinating, lettuce is an easy one to cover with agricultural fabric sacks, um, so there's no cross-pollinating. And that's your lettuce seed. Beets, on the other hand, beets, carrots, onions, parsnips are all biennials. That means they produce their seed in the second year as do all the members of the brassica family. So with beets, there's so much variety again. Mangos are in the same family. That's not mango the fruit, but mangel. That's what they look like. You actually have to overwinter these biennials in order to get the seed in the second year. 
if if our climate wasn't as harsh, then that you wouldn't necessarily have to harvest them, bring them in, save them over winter, and then replant them. But that's exactly what you have to do here. Carrots are another uh, biennial, as I've just mentioned. This is the beautiful dragon carrot, the heirloom. So with carrots, I store them uh, over, uh, over winter in my garage in barrels. I layer with uh, dry straw. And then in the spring, usually March or so, you'll start to see the greens uh, develop on the top. That means they're ready to start producing their seed, as are the beets. So I will plant those back in the garden, usually around April when I can work the soil. I'll dig holes, I'll plant those carrots, those beets, and I'll get the beet seeds uh, oh, over the number of months it takes for the, until the seed is actually ready. The chard is the same. You have to overwinter it. Winter radishes. This is a very intriguing specimen of a long uh, black Spanish radish. And these are different winter radishes, which again, I will overwinter and then replant in the spring. Uh, cabbage, as I mentioned, the brassica family is the same. I'll pull up the cabbage in the fall by the roots, store it in my barrels, replant it in the spring, cut a cross in the top, and the seed stalks will come out of that cross, develop into flowers, and I'll have my seed. This is a radish that I replanted. Those are the radish seed pods, and this is the seed pods when they're ready to go. It's a lot of fun, something a different different part of gardening that a lot of people don't do. The parsnips are one of the easiest biennials because you can simply leave uh, what you don't want to eat in your garden. They'll overwinter really well without any protection at all, produce a whole ton of seed um, for you for the next year. So brassicas again were overwintering. You will get the, the little uh, buds as usual flowers and the seed pods over a long season. Onions, save them over the winter, replant them, and you'll have your onion seed developing for the next year. And then there are these all these other things that are outcrossers. So these will readily cross-pollinate with other, uh, other members of their genus. Squash, for example. Although squash is interesting, um, the, the species that we do eat um, don't necessarily all cross with each other. So we usually consider that there are four species that don't cross with each other. Um, so that would be, let me check my memory here, Papo, Mixta, Moshada, and Maxima. So these are different uh, squash, uh, summer squash, winter squash, pumpkins, Words. So again, check your seed package um, or check online and see what species they're in to see if they would cross. So you actually could plant uh, one member of each of those species in your garden and not have them cross. But if they do cross, if you planted two, two, uh, two things in the same species, then you can get some really wacky things. If you want to uh, ensure you don't have cross-pollination if you've planted two things in the same species, then you'll have to look at, at hand pollinating, which again isn't that different. You're essentially taking the pollen and dabbing it on the female part, uh, the female flower on a squash plant. You can always tell the female because she's the one that's going to have the little, the little fruit already forming, whereas the male doesn't. So you have to just be aware of when that flower is going to, the female flower is going to open up and then close it up, tape up the blossom after you've done the, the hand pollinating. Otherwise, wacky things happen. There's a lot of crossing. Corn is another terrific outcrosser, so corn pollen can travel up to two miles, so if you're in interested in distancing, it's very difficult to do that. Um, the best thing to do with corn is to plant it a couple weeks apart from other varieties in your garden. And that way, the timing ensures that they're not pollinate, cross-pollinating um, or being pollinated at the same time. <clears throat> then we have a whole other bunch of plants that are um, have their female uh, male parts on two different plants. So spinach is an example of that. There is a male and a female, but usually both are contained in, in one seed package. So you don't have to worry about messing around with that, but they do need each other. 
So let's look at some other interesting things to grow in your garden just as I'm finishing up. Globe artichokes grow great in our area. This is a funny little cuke from the West Indies called West Indian Burr Cucumber. It's about two inches long. Super sweet and juicy. Um, I'm sure you might know about the cucumelon. So it's a teeny tiny little fruit, uh, like a sour, sour cucumber taste. Wonderberry, another fun self-seeding little fruit, nice and sweet to eat off the plant. Tiny berries, a little bigger than elderberries though. Cape gooseberry, which I tend to prefer over um, the ground cherry, native to Peru. Really a wonderful tart, sweet taste, really addictive. These are Szechuan buttons from a toothache plant, so pop one of those into your mouth and you get a, an interesting little freezing, numbing action. Quite cool. Cotton, why not? Might as well have fun in your garden. It takes long growing season, but it's not impossible. Sesame seeds, who thought? Um, so the, these little pods will dry in the plant and you've got your nice little sesame seeds all lined up inside, ready to roast. Job's Tears, an ancient millet uh, crop family, in, pardon me, in the millet family. Um, been used in jewelry making for years and years because it's got a hole already through it. This is what it looks like when it's mature. I'm getting ready to plant my plants again, although it does self-seed like crazy. And that brings me to the end. Thank you very much for, for joining me and for listening. I hope I've uh, filled in a few little gaps you might have, but there's so much more to seed saving. And I certainly encourage you to, to read up and do all the research you can. Thank you very much. Let's hope that winter is going to end soon. I can't wait to get out in the garden again. Thank you, and bye-bye.